past three to four months or so, I've been trying to work on something in my life, trying to work on an, an attribute in my life that I have found lacking. This started one day when I actually awoke early enough one morning to do a little work or do a little workout, eat some breakfast, enjoy a cup of coffee, read the Bible, and had time to pray before going to work. During that time, I thought it would also be a good idea to, or a good day to pick at least one thing, one attribute about myself to try to improve. And foolishly, I thought, yeah, I'll knock this one out today, and then every day after that I can work on a few more. So, again, at least three or four months later, I'm still working on it. And that is being grateful. My idea with this is to find at least one thing in any situation, find one thing there to be grateful for. If I'm having a bad day at work, I'm going to be grateful I have a job. If the internet connection in my house is too slow, I'm just going to be glad I have internet connection or I have a house. If Jennifer is mad at me, well, I'll just be glad I have Jennifer in my life. <laughs> Thank you for that. Not that that would ever happen, right? Okay, anyway. So I'll just find something in any situation for which to be grateful. And so this quarter I'm teaching the Young Professionals class, and I thought I will continue that idea uh, of being grateful. And we will use that as, uh, as our background. And we're looking at the book of Philippians, as Brother Johnny just read from, looking at the book of Philippians for our main text. The book of Philippians is, in part, a thank you letter from the Apostle Paul to the church at Philippi. Paul was raised right, his mom was talking to write thank you notes, and that's what he's doing. Philippi, in fact, as, as we read in Paul 1, uh, Philippians 1, 3, again, it states that, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. The other part of, of me learning to be grateful and practicing that is always being grateful that God is with me. Always with me. Rough times and hard times, good times and in between, God is there. And so I need to remember that I am a child of God and that I am loved by Him. Paul wrote Philippians while he was in prison. Imprisoned in Rome. And yet despite being in prison, he speaks of being content. He speaks of a joy in God. And I say despite that, but perhaps it is his exact circumstances, the fact that he is in this uh, Roman prison, that teaches him to be content. In Philippians chapter 4, 11 through 13, we read, Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. So how? How does one develop a level of spiritual maturity so that one can always be grateful? And again, I'm still working on this, and I've been trying to practice it for about four months now. I'm also sure, and I'll pause for a moment and say that perhaps Paul himself wasn't always content. Perhaps he had his moments of self-doubt. Perhaps he had those fleeting times. But still, as we read in this text, in the midst of all this trouble, the overall feeling that Paul gives and relates in this letter is of being in a state of contentment. Or perhaps we should say peace in the moment. Peace in the chaos. Perhaps this is a Mark chapter 4 verse 39 moment for Paul. Peace be still moment for Paul. Because Paul has a purpose and a focus in his life. It is in part because he knows where he belongs, doing God's work, and to whom he belongs. He has found his purpose in life, his one thing that Spencer alluded to a couple of weeks ago in the movie reference. Paul has his one thing. He will proclaim the gospel of Christ with his life, with his words, and with his actions. He knows that God is with him, has been with him, and will always be with him. 
Paul is one who is singularly focused on that one thing in life. Much as we read from the words in red when Jesus answered the Pharisees about the great command, and paraphrasing Matthew chapter 22, verse 36, love God and love your neighbor. Further in Philippians 1, looking around verses 12 through 20, we, we see that Paul's focus is on advancing the gospel. He says, My circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. This is, again, Philippians chapter 1, starting in verse 12. My text will be from the English Standard Version. My circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. So those who have charge of keeping him prisoner are learning about Christ and about the gospel. Further, as we read in verse 14, that because he is in prison, because he is in prison, the brethren are being encouraged and trusting in God more and have more courage to speak the word of God without fear because Paul's in prison. This is a wow moment for me because how? How does Paul going to prison for the sake of the gospel make others more confident? On the surface, this does not make sense. Is it because they're able to see Paul using this experience in a positive way? In this time, Paul is being an encouragement to others by focusing them toward God and the saving power of Jesus, despite his circumstances. To be an encouragement by always praising God. And so we, who call ourselves Christians, need to work on being an encouragement to others by being grateful no matter what. Verses 15 through 17 Paul goes on to say, Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. So some are preaching Christ to simply benefit themselves in some way. But at least they are proclaiming Christ. So this is a wait a minute time. This, is, this would seem to be telling us that God can even use hypocrites. And I don't know about y'all, but I am encouraged to know that God can use a hypocrite. Because I get it wrong all the time, too. So this is good. Paul is okay with this, and so am I. See, I am grateful that God can use and will use me despite my flaws. So Paul is saying, one, he is in prison because of the gospel, and this is good. And two, people are trying to preach from selfish ambition to cause him distress while he is in prison. This is also good. How? Because despite where Paul is and what these people are doing, the gospel is being proclaimed. Proclaiming the gospel and showing people to Jesus is Paul's one thing in life. It gives him purpose. Getting to heaven and taking as many people with him is his focus in life. By verse 19, Paul believes that he will in some way be delivered from this prison. Philippians chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by my life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So Paul is saying that whether he lives or dies, it is good, because Christ will be honored either way, and he will be delivered either way. That whether he is delivered out of jail alive, or is delivered out of jail by death, that is going to heaven, he is delivered either way, and Christ is honored either way. 
In verse 22, he says, If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which shall I choose, I cannot tell. So he either gets to go to heaven, which is great, or he gets to go back to work, which is also great. He is grateful. He is content either way. But he has, in Philippians 1, 23 and following, a little bit of a, what I call a to-be-or-not-to-be moment. He says, I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. He's saying in my paraphrase, Look, y'all, I'd like to go to heaven and be with Jesus, but for your sake, I'll stay here and keep on working. This is sacrifice. This is the second part of the great command, loving your neighbor. This is being so thankful and grateful for Jesus that you want to keep sharing the gospel with others. In verses 27 and 28, Paul exhorts the church at Philippi, saying, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. It reminds them further in, in verses uh, chapter 1, verse 29, through chapter 2, verse 4, that in this work for the sake of Christ, that there will be suffering. He makes no false promises about our life here, but goes on to remind them of the work. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engage in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. So what does this mean for us in 2019? What does this mean for us at Valley View, Church of Christ? How does Paul's circumstances in a Roman prison and his writings to the Philippians help us today. How does all this focus us on being more grateful in life? Sometimes I think we have to not only find an aspect of a situation for which to be grateful, but we also have to adapt to a circumstance and make it good. We have to adapt and overcome. We can read in Acts that Paul wanted to go to Asia to preach and teach there, but was prevented by the Holy Spirit. And so in Acts chapter 16, he was sent to the Macedonian region. This is where we first learn of this church established at Philippi by Paul. From the account in Acts chapter 16, we read that Paul and Silas go to a place of prayer on the Sabbath and teach a group of women. One of these women is named Lydia. It is recorded that her heart was opened by God, and she was baptized and became a Christian. Subsequently, her family was saved as well. Later, Paul is followed by a slave girl with a spirit of divination who is constantly crying out about Paul and his group, saying that these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Paul subsequently, being annoyed by this constant crying out, cast the spirit out of this young lady and incurs the wrath of those who make money off of her ability. So Paul and his entourage are thrown into the Philippian jail. God is with Paul, and an earthquake releases their bonds, scaring the jailer because the jailer is afraid that he'll be held accountable for this jailbreak. 
This gives Paul further opportunity to speak with the jailer who then asks, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And so that very hour, the jailer and all his family were baptized and became followers of Christ. Because of all this, Paul was able to establish the church at Philippi. And after establishing the Philippian church, and before leaving the area, Paul makes a vi last visit to Lydia and the brethren who seem to be using her home as a meeting place. Now remember, Paul has made some very important men, the city officials and magistrates, quite upset by casting out spirits, hurting their livelihood, by teaching about Jesus and teaching that there is a king other than Caesar. This could have also had repercussions on Lydia, but she opens her home. Yet despite this, Lydia opens her home to Paul and the believers in Philippi. Lydia exemplifies what Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, verse 4 again. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but to the interests of others. The believers at Philippi became very important to Paul. And so despite not being allowed to go and preach where he wanted to go originally, he followed God's Spirit. And making the best of a bad situation, so to speak, he was able to establish a church that was a source of encouragement and help to him during his later imprisonment in Rome. So much so that he writes this thank you letter to the Philippians. See, because Paul was grateful to God, not resentful of not getting his way, the trip turned into an opportunity for many to experience the power of God and the gospel. It is sometimes hard to be grateful. But if we focus on Christ, on going to heaven, of taking as many people with us as we can, if we focus on encouraging one another, it will be easier to be grateful. Now, easier does not mean easy. It is difficult to always keep that focus. That is, in part, why we come here and meet. To have a set time to help us focus our life on God. A set time to learn from and lean on each other. A time to learn from and lean on God. To show honor to God and to renew our commitment to Him. Do you need to acknowledge that commitment in a public way today, perhaps? Do you need our help in focusing on God and being grateful for the healing power and cleansing power of Christ? If you do, please come while we stand and sing. Just as I